The law recognizes several exceptions to the statute of frauds. In this context, an exception refers to a situation where a court would disallow the statute of frauds defense. That is, it would allow evidence of the oral contract to be admitted even though the contract is within the statute and there is no writing that satisfies the statute. Both the General Statute of Frauds and the UCC Statute of Frauds have recognized exceptions, but in each case different exceptions exist. Moreover, when the General Statute of Frauds applies, different states have adopted different exceptions, usually by judicial decision, that is, by a common law interpretation of the statute. The General Statute of Frauds recognizes an exception based upon part performance or other reliance when the transaction involves an interest in real estate. The Beaver v. Brumlow case in the text illustrates this exception. The second restatement, Section 129, also articulates this exception. Notice that this exception is limited to cases involving real estate. It is also limited to cases where the injured party wants to enforce the oral contract. It is not available in cases where the injured party is seeking damages. The exception has two requirements. The party seeking enforcement of the contract must have changed position in reliance on the oral contract, and that reliance must be reasonable. Section 129 overlaps to a considerable degree with Section 90 and the doctrine of promissory estoppel. This has led some, but not all, jurisdictions to adopt Section 90 as an exception to the statute of frauds. This has allowed courts to apply a reliance-based exception to situations beyond the transfer of real estate, and it has allowed them to award damages. In other words, by using Section 90, courts can avoid the limitations of Section 129. Alaska Democratic Party v. Rice in the text is an example of this exception. The UCC statute of frauds has its own set of exceptions. Two of them are variations on section 129. UCC section 2-201 subsection 3a provides that a contract for more than $500 for which there is no sufficient writing but which is otherwise valid is enforceable. This exception for specially manufactured goods protects a seller who is partially performed by beginning the manufacturing process. Assume, for example, that wholesaler has ordered by phone a specially designed widget costing $2,000 for its warehouse. Manufacturer has to fabricate the special widget from scratch. When it's almost complete, wholesaler calls and cancels the order. The special widget is larger than ordinary widgets, and there are only three other companies who could use such a widget, all of whom are on the other side of the country. So manufacturer ends up melting the widget down for scrap. Assume there is no writing that satisfies the statute. Does the specially manufactured goods exception apply? 1. Was the widget specially manufactured? Yes. 2. Is it suitable for sale to others in the ordinary course of the seller's business? Probably not. There are three other potential buyers, but it sounds like the manufacturer ordinarily sells smaller widgets. 3. Did the seller make a substantial beginning to the manufacture of or commitments to procure the materials for the good? Yes. 4. Did the seller do this before receiving notice of the buyer's repudiation of the contract? Yes. 5. Do the circumstances reasonably indicate that this widget was to be sold to this buyer as opposed to other possible customers of the seller? Yes. Conclusion. It appears the exception would apply, taking the transaction out of the statute and allowing manufacturer to introduce evidence concerning the oral agreement. Remember, though, that the fact finder could still disbelieve manufacturer. All the exception does is allow the manufacturer to take its case to trial. Section 2-201, subsection 3C, provides another part performance exception to the UCC statute of frauds with respect to goods for which payment has been made and accepted or which have been received and accepted. This exception can protect either the seller or the buyer through part performance. Even if there is no writing that satisfies the statute, 
If the buyer has made payment which is accepted by the seller, then the buyer can introduce evidence about the oral contract. Conversely, if the seller has delivered the goods which have been accepted by the buyer, then the seller can introduce evidence of the oral agreement. A third exception to the UCC statute of frauds applies if the party who raised the statute of frauds defense admits, in his pleading testimony or otherwise in court, that a contract has been made. The exact parameters of this exception, especially that otherwise in court, are the subject of debate. The reasoning behind this exception, however, is well accepted. If a party admits a fact in their pleadings, for example in an answer to a complaint, that a party is a stop from later denying that fact. So if in answer to a complaint for breach of contract, a party admits that there was an oral contract, that party will be prohibited, that is, is stopped, from arguing in a motion to dismiss that the contract is unenforceable under the statute of frauds. The last exception under the UCC is usually referred to as the merchant's exception, because it only applies if both the buyer and seller are merchants. Keep in mind that the UCC in general applies to all sales of goods, not just those between two merchants. The merchant's exception is found in UCC 2-201 subsection 2, which provides... In essence, this exception allows a writing signed by merchant A to be sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds as against merchant B, even though merchant B did not sign the writing. Let's revisit the hypo from part two. Recall that the wholesaler called up the manufacturer on the phone and ordered $50,000 worth of widgets. When manufacturer received the phone call from wholesaler, he grabbed a company form which had the logo of the company on it and blanks for item, price, quantity, etc. There was also a box for the initials of the person taking the call. Manufacturer filled out the form. As we discussed, the form would be sufficient to satisfy the UCC statute of frauds against manufacturer, but not against wholesaler, because wholesaler did not sign the form. But, assume that after taking the phone call, the manufacturer faxed the form to the wholesaler. A month goes by and the wholesaler does not object. Does the merchant's exception now apply? Well, was the deal between two merchants? Yes. Did the manufacturer send a writing confirming the deal to the wholesaler within a reasonable time? Yes. Was the writing sufficient to satisfy the statute against the manufacturer? Yes. Did the wholesaler have reason to know of its contents? Apparently. Did wholesaler give written objection within 10 days of receiving the form? No. Under the merchant's exception, the form is now sufficient to satisfy the statute against the wholesaler even though the wholesaler never signed the form. This concludes the coverage of the statute of frauds. So, to summarize, statute of frauds analysis requires a three-step process. First, you must determine whether the contract is within the statute, that is, whether it is the type of transaction which is covered by the statute of frauds. Second, if the contract is within the statute, you must determine whether there is a writing that satisfies the statute. The writing need not be a written contract, but it must be signed by the party to be charged and meet whatever the relevant standard is. Third, if the contract is within the statute and there is no writing that satisfies the statute, you must determine whether any of the exceptions apply. If the contract is within the statute, there is no writing that satisfies the statute, and no exceptions apply, then the oral contract will be unenforceable.